God's Unpredictable Politics. I live in Iowa, and today is caucus day. The 2016 election cycle is the longest and most expensive one yet, and as the first state to weigh in on who the nominees for president should be, Iowa has gotten very excited about the race. Lots of people are worried about the political implications of the caucus or the election in general, as is to be expected. In particular, there are some people who are concerned about the potential religious implications of this election, though this isn't unique to this year's election as it comes up every time. Some people are worried that we will elect a Christian and continue to send the message that, in spite of the constitutional ban on requiring elected officials to have certain religious convictions, you really need to be a Christian usually a particular kind of evangelical Christian, in order to be a viable candidate. Others have precisely the opposite concern. Such people are worried that we will not elect a Christian, the concern being that if we have a non-Christian president, we will not be governed by biblical principles, and as a result, America will either begin to have troubles or continue to have troubles, depending on one's perspective before the election. Speaking for myself, I find that the more election cycles I live through, the less I get worked up over any particular election. I remember when the 2004 election was called in favor of George W. Bush, everyone I knew on the right side of the aisle rejoiced and talked about how it was a great day for America, while everyone I knew on the left lamented and talked about how they were considering leaving the country over the issue, though nobody actually did. The 2008 presidential election, which went to Barack Obama, had exactly the opposite effect. Everyone I knew on the left rejoiced and talked about how it was a great day for America, while everyone I knew on the right lamented and talked about how they were considering leaving the country over the issue, though nobody actually did. More startling still was the fact that so many people were unable to see that the, that the two reactions were mirror images of each other. I suspect it has to do with our tendency to see those who agree with us as intelligent, respectful people who value the truth, and those who disagree with us as people who hate our country and want to cause division among the people. I would like to suggest that while we all have our various political convictions and our reasons for holding them, which we will all usually think of as good reasons that hold up to scrutiny, unlike the reasons of others for their views— we should not be too quick to assume we know what God is or is not doing in the midst of this political season and the selection of our nation's leaders. The reason I want to suggest this is because I'm not at all certain that we have any ability to predict the things that God will do. There are several places where the scriptures describe God selecting leaders in a way that is totally different than what we would expect, and sometimes God selects leaders that we would, in our culture today, find morally repulsive, and would be clearly unelectable in the early 21st century. Consider Gideon. Here was a man who had no military experience. He tried to weasel his way out of leadership and put God to the test over and over again in a massive attempt to reduce the calling to, of God into a coincidence that he can ignore with a clear conscience. God calls him to make a grand symbolic gesture, tearing down his father's altar to Baal and cutting down his Asherah pole. He goes to liberate the people as he was told to, but God insists that he reduce his army from 32,000 down to a mere 300 men. Even the most anti-military candidate today would never suggest that the godly thing to do is to cut back our military so that it is less than 1% of its present size. Gideon would be totally unelectable. He was a weak leader, lacking in conviction, and he would be portrayed as a hater of the military, in spite of his calling to lead the people into a military victory. How about Samson? He has many issues that would, in 2016, prevent his being taken seriously as a candidate for president. He's hot-tempered, flying into rages. He made bad choices just to irritate his parents, and often leaped to some pretty extreme forms of revenge. Perhaps he could try to reclaim the religious vote by emphasizing that he was a Nazarite, a man dedicated to the Lord from his youth. Of course, he essentially followed none of the requirements for the Nazarites, except to grow his hair out. But if he shouted Nazarite loud enough and often enough, it might make a difference in how religious people felt about him. When we look to David, we find perhaps the paradigm example of the kind of leader God chooses. However, it doesn't really matter which time of his life we consider we will find something objectionable that could disqualify him as a viable candidate for public office, especially the presidency. 
At the beginning of his story, he's a young man, perhaps no older than 15. Aside from the constitutional problems that would bring, he also had no experience. He was a shepherd, and as everyone knows, caring for sheep is not the same as leading a nation or commanding an army. Even if we look to his early days as king over Israel, we see things that would surely rise to the surface in an attack ad. For a time, David ran away from Israel in order to get away from Israel's king. He didn't just leave the country, though. He ran to the Philistines, Israel's sworn enemy. Even if we can make the case, biblically, that he was never really loyal to the Philistines, would modern American voters believe it? Or would it be seen as raising very serious questions as to his ability to lead the country he once fled? Of course, that's not the whole story of David. Later still, we see that he had an affair with the wife of one of his greatest warriors, got her pregnant, and had her husband killed. Even if we point out that, according to the biblical text, David repented, it's entirely possible that the people would doubt his sincerity. In David, we see that it is apparently possible that someone can commit adultery and murder, and yet that does not necessarily prevent God from working through them. It might, however, cost someone an election. Solomon was an interesting king. On the one hand, he made Israel as great as it had ever been. He built the temple and magnificent buildings. However, he did it by levying massive taxes on the people, which would irritate the 2016 conservative crowd, and this heavy tax burden did not lead to social welfare programs, which would irritate the 2016 liberal crowd. Perhaps the greatest example of someone that we venerate on Sundays, but would never elect to office in real life, is Jesus. The people wanted a Messiah. They cried out to God for a Messiah. They wanted justice. They wanted freedom. And they wanted God to come and make it happen. And so he did. But it wasn't the Messiah we wanted. We wanted a man to deliver us from political oppression. But God a man, indeed God as man, who delivered us from spiritual oppression and to call us to repent of the part that we play in social oppression. We wanted justice in the form of the elimination of unrighteous overlords, but we got justice in the form of forgiveness and empowerment from the God who created us. We wanted freedom from foreign rulers who took our money and scorned our God. What we got instead was freedom from our own need to dominate others. We would never elect Jesus to high office. He had too many strange positions on things. He claimed that if someone wrongs us, we are to endure the wrong and shower love and compassion on the wrongdoer in response. He claimed that we are to forgive those who sin against us, not seven times, but 70 times, seven times. He didn't achieve victory through military might, but by suffering and dying on the cross. It's clear that God's plans for us involve doing some things that may not be popular and certainly wouldn't get him elected in 2016. So what do these examples show? They show us that we in general would not select the people God selects, at least if we are at all like God's people throughout history, and we are. It means that at least sometimes the things we value are wrong. There are some times when the kind of leaders that God wants his people to have, or at least the kind of leaders that God seems to have no problem using, are the kind of leaders that we would never choose for ourselves. If that is so, then we have to say that sometimes, no matter how biblical our reasoning may be, we might not be getting at God's will at all. Because of all this, we should be intentional about opening ourselves to the possibility that the candidate we do not support, perhaps even the one we fear will bring America into ruins, might turn out to be precisely who God is calling to lead our country. Not for our destruction, but for our prosperity. Regardless of who wins, whether the Iowa caucus, the nomination, or the general election, let us commit ourselves to abandon any fear-mongering we might be prone to, and to see where God is at work in the midst of it all. <laughs>